Okay, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Uh, my name's Cathy Wassell and I run Autistic Girls Network Charity, uh, which is a really small charity that supports autistic girls and their families and campaigns for earlier diagnosis. So I have wanted to get somebody to come and talk to us about being autistic and ADHD for a long time now, because it's something that is really, really common in our kind of cohort, if you like. Um, many of the families that are in our Facebook group have uh, young people that are ODHD, and of course, many of them are ODHD themselves. Um, so I think it's it's a really interesting topic to talk about. Um, and I'm really pleased to welcome Doc, Dr. Emma Craddock here tonight, um, who has been researching this topic, among a few other things, but has been researching this topic and is going to give us um, a presentation. And then after that, we will be taking questions. Um, so feel free um, to introduce yourselves in the chat um, or to put questions in the chat. If the chat gets really busy, it would be really helpful if um, you put question and then write your question and it just makes it easier to see because I haven't got anybody helping me tonight. So it's just me and my poor ADHD menopause brain um, might not be able to cope. So <laughs> and also I haven't slept since three o'clock this morning, so I'm very, very tired. Um, so I'm going to hand over before I garble any more. Um, and let you uh, listen to what Emma's got to say. Thanks very much, Cathy. And I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, so thank you for staying up um, to host this. So I'm going to be speaking about um, what I've called the complexity and confusion of being a late diagnosed ODHD woman. I'm talking from my own experiences and also from um, participants from a piece of research that I've done recently. And I'm a very visual thinker, so I put images throughout this presentation and this kind of um, image, one of those motion sensor timers, I thought was quite a nice image to show the sort of mixing of the two of autism and ADHD and how they can mix but we'll talk more about that so briefly to kind of um say who i am um my name is emma craddock i did a phd in sociology at the university of nottingham um, which resulted in the publication of my book living against austerity and that was focused on looking at um feminist research about anti-austerity activist cultures so people who protest against public spending cuts particularly women's role within activism and the activist identity I'm currently a senior lecturer in health research at Birmingham City University. I've been there for five years now, and my postdoctoral research has focused in the areas of women's health. This has included looking at a project with um, the Women's Health Network in Bradford, a project looking at period poverty, and most recently exploring women's experiences of late diagnosed autism and ADHD. Focus today is going to be on um, late diagnosed autism and ADHD. I am myself late diagnosed autistic and ADHD or ADHD um, woman. The bits, um, that's the kind of professional, possibly more boring introduction. Um, the more fun parts about me are that I currently, well, I have now a puppy who's no, now nearly an uh, adult dog. He's one um, called Lockie and a cat called Mog who is... Uh, likes to get involved in my work, as you can see from that picture. I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan, a big Swifty, so looking forward to going to see her this summer. Um, I like to watch reality TV that's um, often quite rubbish reality TV, such as the example um, Outback, Outback Opal Hunters. And I'm also a huge purple lover. My favourite colour is purple, and I'm convinced that people whose favourite colour is purple do not just like purple, but are obsessed with the colour and have everything purple if possible um, but I haven't tested that yet so I just want to start um, by reading a bit of an extract from an article that I recently published um, to kind of give a bit of a, a story or overview of my particular experience in this area so I walked into the gym and froze the kettlebells had been moved their colors were in a new order the cardio equipment had been relocated. Nothing seemed how it was. I felt uneasy and exclaimed to my personal trainer, everything's wrong. They're meant to be by the window. 
This wasn't the first time I'd experienced a visceral reaction to changes in my environment. I once became particularly distressed at the sofa being changed in my counsellor's room. I used to torture myself over why I was like this. Why did I get so upset about things that didn't seem to bother others? I was intelligent and a high achiever despite leaving my work until the last minute and operating on the constant roller coaster of high productive peaks and deeply depressed troughs. Yet the many decisions, steps and multitasking involved in cooking a meal could send me over the edge. It didn't make sense. I was constantly exhausted. People exhausted me. Life exhausted me. I now know that I'm dyspraxic, autistic and ADHD. The depression, anxiety and panic attacks I struggled with for years were likely burnout and sensory overload. Reading Sarah Hendrick's book, Women and Girls with Autism Spectrum Disorder, was a light bulb moment for me. She was describing me, my childhood, my unique weirdness. I couldn't cope with uncertainty and change, however small. The wrong texture of clothes could drive me to losing my temper. I was an extremely bland and fussy eater. I couldn't stand when things were wrong or unjust. I would get fixated on what others could easily let go of. I spent my whole life trying to figure out what others meant when they spoke, because they never said what they meant. I'd become obsessed with topics and immerse myself, shutting myself, shutting everything else out. Animals were my biggest allies. I couldn't master gears in a car. I was clumsy. I had overwhelming emotional outbursts that I really should have grown out of by now. And I was always late, always lost everything. If I can't see something, it no longer exists. I have multiple copies of things, having forgotten I've already bought them. I feel like I have multiple monkeys in my brain that all need to be kept busy at the same time in order to, for me to wrestle control over my mind and body. The racing thoughts never stop. When I discovered I was autistic, I suddenly realised it wasn't just me. There wasn't something deeply wrong with me. I wasn't failing at life and unable to cope with the same mundane tasks that others breathe through. I experienced the world in a different way. But this wasn't the whole story. I didn't fit neatly into the autistic box. Learning about ADHD explained why. I was ADHD. My story is not unique. My research about late diagnosed women's experiences of autism and ADHD shines a light on the roller coaster lives, misdiagnoses, mental health difficulties, and negative self perceptions of ADHD women who have lived a life undiagnosed. So today I'm going to kind of briefly talk a little bit about um, ADHD, so autism and ADHD as a combined condition. Um, thinking about why women have been missed and dismissed, the negative and lasting impacts of being missed and dismissed, a little bit about um, the paradox of ADHD, so the kind of contradictions that can sometimes make it quite difficult um, navigating and understanding the conditions. Thinking about after diagnosis and post diagnosis support or support gaps, as the case is. And the focus is really going to be on women diagnosed in adulthood with autism and ADHD. And I just wanted to kind of give a, a brief content warning as there are some quotations um, that discuss difficult times of women's lives um, due to the nature of this particular topic, unfortunately, that a lot of women who are late diagnosed have experienced a lot of trauma throughout their lives. So autism, then just a brief overview um, and definition. Um, autism spectrum, as it's referred to in the diagnostic manual, um, is autism spectrum disorder, but it's often referred to as autism spectrum condition um, by autistic people because it's less deficits based. Um, it's a complex neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by a range of challenges in social interaction, communication and restricted or repetitive behaviors. It's called a spectrum disorder because individuals with, with autism or autistic individuals can vary widely in their presentation. Community definitions of autism tend to center on um, what's been called spiky profiles um, with varying impairments and different in different areas and tend to also center the sensory challenges of autism more than the diagnostic criteria does. ADHD is characterized by persistent patterns of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity that interfere with daily functioning. So there are three subtypes of ADHD, predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive, impulsive, and the combined presentation, which combines the two. 
diagnostic criteria varies um, from different locations geographically, um, but it also is important to note that it varies from community shared definitions and understandings. So there are often um, particular characteristics of autism and or ADHD that are widely rec recognized within the community, neurodivergent communities that aren't within the diagnostic criteria. So things like um, rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria for ADHD, and like I mentioned with autism, the sensory um, profile. So autism and ADHD are most often treated separately and diagnosed separately, um, despite the high likelihood of their co-occurrence. So we don't fully know um, the kind of exact numbers. And obviously, often, often with statistics, they don't reflect the reality of how many people do have both. But it's currently estimated that 30 to 80 percent of individuals with ADHD are also autistic. This is partly because a combined diagnosis has only been possible, um, according to the DSM-5, the Diagnostics, uh, Diagnostic Manual, um, since 2013, because before that you could only be diagnosed as one or the other um, because of the contradictions between some of the um, symptoms or characteristics. I've put up here... Um, this image of red plus blue. So if we think of, say, autism as red and ADHD as blue equals purple in the um, I do think and feel and from participants as well that ADHD or the combination of both is different than just one or the other. There are um, sex biases um, with diagnosis for autism and ADHD, um, which has been the case <clears throat> which has been the case for um, historically, essentially. Um, so neurodivergent women and girls have been overlooked by the medical profession. A lot of research and studies that were done in this area excluded women and girls. So the diagnosis criteria itself is focused more on a male presentation um, and women also are have been shown to kind of have more... Um, more tendency to mask so to display neurotypical behaviors or hide their neurodivergence so um, <clears throat> that's not picked up on as much um, like I said this is partly because um, clinicians have failed to identify the differences um, between boys and girls and sort of stereotypical images of what we've seen of autism and ADHD often are associated with men um, but this has starting to be changed now and with this we're seeing that an increasing number of women are gaining awareness of and actively pursuing and receiving diagnoses. So what are late diagnosed women's experiences of autism and ADHD? We're very much in the infancy of research that explores women's adulthood diagnoses of autism. Um, there are some studies that explore this, but there's less about women's adulthood diagnoses of ADHD, although that's starting to emerge now. At the moment, there's an absence of research that considers women's experiences of combined diagnoses, so of both ADHD and autism. So when I was first diagnosed, I um, wanted to find out everything that I could and explore and learn and look at the research. And I was quite surprised to find that there just wasn't anything out there, um, particularly anything qualitative that explores women's experiences. There just wasn't anything that explored this. Um, and so I decided that it was an area that obviously was really important to learn more about and that I wanted to find out more and start to build up a picture of academic research related to this. So I did um, started doing my own research, um, exploring women's experiences of being diagnosed in adulthood with both. And I did that as a small scale study where I spoke to, I did um, in-depth email interviews with six um, participants. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the kind of key findings that came out of that. So I've also put this like purple speech bubble um, wherever there's participant quotations so that you know that the kind of, and it's also in italics so that you know that those words come from participants. So one of the kind of um, key reasons of why 
women um, are, are quite essentially not diagnosed until much later is that they were missed and dismissed because of gendered stereotypes. This meant that participants did not meet gender stereotypes of autism and ADHD, like I've discussed previously, um, based on males. And therefore, they were missed, though unrecognised and undiagnosed by those in their life, which included family, colleagues, teachers, friends, professionals, as well as by themselves. Um, as participant April explains, the stereotypical image of autism is socially awkward men who struggle with social interaction or perhaps collect facts, etc. Well, the stereotype of the of ADHD is the naughty, externally hyperactive schoolboy, and a lack of lack of knowledge about and representation of female presentation of both conditions prevented participants from recognizing that they were autistic and ADHD. Um, so we've got here as well, and a participant said, I only really knew what was portrayed on the TV, especially about autism. I didn't know much about what female traits were at all for either condition. And this was quite interesting. One of the participants um, was a psychologist and, and worked um, in similar areas. And she said that I didn't have really have any training in ADHD and thought it was more the stereotype running around stuff and also stereotype to boys. So even a woman who was in working professionally in an area where you'd think it would be recognised more, that wasn't the case. This enduring influence of dominance gender stereotypes of these kind of predominantly male traits resulted in women also experiencing disbelief and dismissal from others when they disclose their diagnoses that they later had. So it's important to note that a diagnosis is also not a ticket to kind of automatic recognition or acceptance for women. When participants did seek professional help, um, they were dismissed and the, or misdiagnosed because of gender stereotypes. And this was not only of neurodivergence, but also of mental health. So women were more likely to be diagnosed with mental health conditions. This had dangerous consequences for some and resulted in participants feeling really let down by the system, grief and anger. Um, so one person said, I was also frequently diagnosed with anxiety, depression, low mood and other related conditions over a 20 plus year period. When realistically, these were all related to ADHD. For example, a change in my life would inevitably lead to a depressive episode, even if the change was a positive one. For years, I believed that I was bipolar, but now believe that I, what I was experiencing was a combination of ADHD hyperactivity, autistic burnout, and antidepressant-induced hypermania. So this participant was treated um, for many years for bipolar um, depression and also um, depression before that, and the treatment actually had a very negative effect on her. So... I've talked, I've called this kind of the invisibility cloak of neurotypical femininity. And um, if there's any Harry Potter fans, I've, I've thought about the kind of cloak that Harry, Harry Potter can put on and make himself invisible. Um, because participants often talked about not only trying to mask to come across as neurotypical, so to kind of fit in with the majority and not seem neurodivergent, but also having to mask to be what is expected as a feminine um, girl or woman to, in order to fit in fit in as a woman so I learned to be social because that was important especially to a girl essential to trying to fit in I was very clever and related better to adults teachers like me for this but also I stuck to the rules so wouldn't always fit in and be liked from others with, with others from a long, young age this left me feeling there was something wrong with me yet no one ever considered autism because I wasn't stereotypical of symptoms which are male-based I was quiet, studious, apparently hardworking, was a pleasure to have in class, etc. This meant my teachers never saw the struggles I had with procrastinating on everything, nor the copious tears that came with said chronic procrastination, i.e. they completely missed my executive dysfunction and spiky cognitive profile that should have pointed to ADHD. So there's a gendered dimension to women's masking with attempts made not only to fit in, but also to adequately perform um, femininity. And these ended kind of these sort of gendered stereotypes serve to render ADHD women and girls invisible. April um, in this, that's a pseudonym, don't worry, so it's ethical. Um, but April, the participant in this um, 
quotation highlights also how being academically gifted and particularly if you're an academically gifted girl or woman can lead to struggles being completely missed um, or dismissed because if you're appearing to perform well um, not causing trouble being quiet then you essentially aren't causing problems to anyone else so it's not flagged and not recognized the difficulties that you're internally facing and this is a common theme that comes through is that women and girls often have a more internalized presentation of autism and ADHD. So a lot of this is what stuff that's going on inside um, behind the scenes. And they're masking this, um, which is hidden both by their academic and gendered performance. However, the burden of masking, so... Um, <clears throat> Participants tried really, really hard to mask and fit in both as neurotypical, but also as the kind of um, ideal girl or feminine woman, feminine girl. And this caused um, problems. So one person said, my sensory discomfort has been increased by wearing bras and high heels. These days I try not to wear either. Throughout my life, I have often tried to mimic the appearance of other women, including their style of dress. So wearing heels or nice outfits was very much part of my attempt to fit in. <clears throat> but the physical discomfort was just too much. My feet would often rub and I would get blisters. So I stopped wearing heels a few years ago other than on special occasions such as special dinner. Being bad at performing the femininity and maintaining the female social relationships expected of me was a key factor in the years of bullying I endured. And being bad at being feminine and female relationships was a direct consequence of me being undiagnosed autistic. So this invisibility cloak of neurotypical femininity is actually a very heavy and comfortable um, cloak that doesn't always work. So some participants weren't able to pass as kind of normal or neurotypical women. Um, and also when you were able to pass, it still, there was a lot of work that had to go into this and caused a lot of discomfort. There are also risks of um, masking as a woman and trying to um, fit in and perform a perceived gender role of being a woman, which combines with unrecognized autism to enhance vulnerability for some um, participants. So one participant said that my self-esteem and personal boundaries have been severely affected by expectations or perceived expectations of what a girl woman should be. I have been sexually assaulted on several occasions because of what I now can see is my inability to read a situation or to know that something is just not OK. Similarly, Amelia describes how maladaptive coping strategies, so less healthy coping strategies, such as drinking alcohol as a teenager in order to fit in with others, increased her levels of risk and heightened her vulnerability. In my teens, I began to drink. It helped me be social and feel normal. But in reality, I ended up in many unsafe situations because of it. Being undiagnosed resulted in trauma for all participants. From experiencing traumatic events of gender-based violence, abusive relationships and interpersonal challenges, challenges in academic study and employment, to mental health impacts from the cumulative effects of being undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, the masking burden I've mentioned, and from struggling to fit neurotypical norms. All participants had experienced unexplained psychological and physical symptoms throughout their lifetime that they now attribute to undiagnosed neurodivergence. So they say, all through life, I went through periods of not coping. I was physically unwell at times, but there was never a cause. I had anxiety from childhood, but never realised what it was at that time. Social difficulties, relationships, fatigue, burnout, mild sensory issues, going from one job to another, depression, anxiety, never quite fitting in, not reaching full potential in educational jobs, doing things in impulse, drinking when younger and putting myself in dangerous situations resulting in trauma. The list goes on. So there's a lot of um, accumulative trauma that um, the women have faced. So this um, sort of accumulative effect is um, <clears throat> quite, I've put a, an image here of a bucket with water kind of dripping and dripping until it overflows, because I think this accumulative effect of kind of multiple personal crises throughout life was quite um, negative and long lasting for um, the women that I spoke with. Um, so one um, 
participant said how in the last couple of years I've moved countries tri- twice, broken up with my long term partner, and found out in, I am all DHD. Another participant said how life, in all honesty, has been a bit of a roller coaster. Um, I'm very functional. Well, I seem to be. I'm actually working hard between behind the scenes. And this participant explained, um, gave a really lovely metaphor of how in the Wizard of Oz you have the kind of um, wizard who seems very grand and massive and um but is actually just there's lots of kind of work going on and levers being pulled behind the scenes to to put on this performance and how that was how she felt about daily life um as i mentioned um participants also experienced bullying mental health struggles um and also trying to sort of solve what they called like the puzzle of themselves and trying to understand this issue of why um they struggled more than others added to this um the impact of female hormones further intensified struggles faced by participants as undiagnosed neurodivergent girls and women as perimenopause and menopause often acted as catalysts for seeking a diagnosis um so one participant said i feel certain that my female hormonal cycle has exacerbated my conditions uh, sorry, exacerbated my emotional dysregulation, making my conditions even more difficult to manage. There are a lot of perimenopausal women hitting a wall at this time and only then realising neurodivergence because suddenly things can be too much and realise they've masked it their entire lives. There is a clear link to late diagnosis of ADHD of women who mask and struggle through decades and then the wheels fall off. And quite a few participants spoke about different um experiences of how perimenopause and menopause um, exacerbated their struggles and it was really a point of time at which they realized um, they they weren't coping anymore and these accumulative crises um, essentially things came to a head um, as one participant explained it after diagnosis um, it's a bit of a mixed picture Um, I think particularly because of um the combination of autism and adhd one participant said how i feel the more i expand it becomes less clear not clearer um so there are issues trying to make sense of your own experience and your life history and also your conditions gender stereotypes impact how others perceive them and their self-perceptions i've mentioned previously participants are um engaging in this ongoing project of sort of reauthoring their life and self so there's some research that suggests that this process of rewriting our story and who we how we see ourselves is really important in being able to claim that and to kind of move forward but it's very hard to do this when it's hard to explain and make sense of combined diagnoses because of some of the contradictions there there's a lot of relief felt um, and validation from getting a diagnosis, getting an answer, which can help to build confidence. Um, but there's also grief and difficulties and a lot of ambivalence. So ambivalence is sort of contradiction was something that came up a lot. There's crisis of identity. So I've mentioned that it's important to have this sort of re authoring or reframing of your life experiences in light of diagnoses in order to be able to develop a positive neurodivergent identity Um, but a lot of participants were questioning the diagnoses some felt that um, a bit of imposter syndrome because you don't fit in one box or the other so it's hard to um, sort of really understand fully and find a sort of a place where you feel like you belong um there's also a lot of hard work to be done to undo the sort of an internalized ableism that happens and builds up over many years and all of this sort of accumulative impacts so one participant said i've struggled a great deal with imposter syndrome thinking that i am not autistic or adhd enough to warrant the diagnosis This, like I've kind of touched upon, can be made harder from what I've called here the paradox of ADHD in the, and this is something that's came through a lot through participants' narratives, is the contradictions between autism and ADHD and trying to figure out your experience and yourself within this. So one participant, Julia, said, I find it difficult to articulate my ADHD experience and identity in in a holistic way. It very much feels as if there are these two separate parts of my brain, the autistic part and the ADHD part. Amelia says having autism and ADHD is hard to describe because although some traits are very similar, 
others are conflicting. I think for me, it almost feels at times like I'm two different people. Someone who needs routine, needs everything in its place to function, likes to collect things, prefers her own company, versus someone who craves excitement at times, can't stick to a routine long term, does things on impulse, etc. Daily life is like a constant battle between my single track mind and the myriad of jumbled thoughts in my brain. I can be so frustrated with myself, for example, when I lose my earbuds for the nth time, which is ADHD, but I need them to regulate for autism. A lot of the time, I feel like a contradiction within myself. Often participants try to make sense of autism and ADHD by constructing them as being opposites that clashed so it was also often autism versus ADHD and what was quite interesting was that autism was often seen as the sort of um, core part of who they were and um, more positively whereas ADHD was seen as, as being a negative louder chaotic and disruptive opponent to autism that's more externalized and visible to others so I have ADHD as well, and that is a thing that is much more evident to outside eyes. I cannot keep my office or house tidy. It gets out of hand, and I struggle with prioritising, etc. But the autism is the much quieter inside me. It's the wise, watchful part. It's the wary wariness of people. It's the joy of living with only cats and not humans. It's the quiet stims that comfort me. It's the hyper-focus. What I like about ADHD? Nothing. It feels like this chaotic, disruptive, destabilizing force within me. But I have no idea what it's like to be autistic without also having or being ADHD. So at the same time as seeing the two as clashing, participants also sometimes saw that ADHD balances out autism. So it was seen sometimes as being something that can act as like a counterbalance um, and can be complementary. So participants say it's a good thing at times because I feel they can balance each other out but when they are conflicting or one dominates the other it's a nightmare to navigate your life so I feel my autism alone would make me avoid these situations but my ADHD drives me to do these things and enjoy them and a few participants said that ADHD brings, brings flexibility to their life and kind of pushes them out of um, their autistic comfort zone so giving them um, that positive element Being an undiagnosed girl and woman is a confusing and traumatising experience. Participants experience traumatic events, poor mental health, felt and were often bullied for being different from a young age, but lacked an explanation for this difference. This led to the internalisation of negative judgments about themselves, damaging their self-esteem and self-concept. Um, so participants talked about how before diagnosis they felt that they were failures and the kind of lasting impact of this. They reflect on their lives and what could have been had they received an earlier diagnosis. So going through the system or struggling on your own for so many years while not knowing why your mental health is so awful can erode your confidence and damage your sense of self so profoundly. Over the years, I have felt so mad and unstable. Sometimes I wonder whether an earlier diagnosis might have helped me to understand my brain better and develop a more robust, resilient, stable sense of self. I think that I would be a very different person today had I been diagnosed as a child or younger adult. I've gone through a period of grieving for the life I could have had, for the lonely child that I was and for poor decisions I've made. There's also a very big issue that despite the negative enduring impacts of living a life undiagnosed and also misdiagnosed, post-diagnostic support is lacking. Um, <clears throat> or completely yeah completely lacking enough in a lot of cases um which leaves women to process and navigate this life-changing information by themselves so Amelia says how this is all new I have no support as I don't believe there is any and Juliet says that honestly I think that I need a lot more support than I currently have I'm unemployed mentally fragile and socially isolated some participants found therapy to be invaluable at supporting them to reclaim their lives and their sense of identity post-diagnosis, but the cost barriers of this prevented them from receiving the level of support that they needed. So to sum up, I've kind of done a bit of a whistle-stop tour around um, some of the sort of main themes in terms of ADHD women and girls who have been missed for decades um, due to sex biases of diagnostic criteria and gender stereotypes 
Women are now being increasingly diagnosed. However, there are lasting negative impacts of being missed and dismissed. The paradox of autism and ADHD can make it harder to understand ourselves and experiences. There's currently a lack of post-diagnostic support, um, but a need for specific trauma-informed or ADHD post-diagnostic support for women. And we really need to be listening to women's voices who have this experience to increase understanding. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'd be very happy to ask, answer any questions. And I've also put a link to a couple of articles that I've recently written um, a bit more in detail around this. And my email address is also there if anyone wants to email me about any of this. That's brilliant. Thanks, Emma. Um, Thank and you. I can absolutely, you know, see the parallels. Um, it almost everything that you were saying there, or rather that your participants were saying there, was pretty much what came up in my research to, um, you know, about an internal presentation and and looking at um the effects of not being diagnosed and and how people feel about that uh, and what they what they feel is done to their lives if you like uh, so yeah mm -hmm. very very similar um and you know in that sense the effects of of being undiagnosed as autistic or as adhd are are pretty much exactly the same uh, in fact who knows in 10 years time who knows yeah. maybe we won't be talking about autism and adhd maybe it will be something all squeezed together right so um i'm very happy to take questions now we are going to finish by nine uh, so that i can go to bed <laughs> yes. but we are we i'm very happy to take questions up until then so let me just go back a bit i don't think there were any questions before that so let me just find the first one hang on a minute um Giovanna is asking if you could, if you have time, Emma, if you could put the links that are on the screen in the chat. Um, but the first question is, what are the okay. views around, oh, it's disappeared. What are the views around self-diagnosis self-realization given the struggles in getting assessed and diagnosed current wait to get assessed is four plus years in Dorset yeah I think this is a really interesting topic and I think people vary on their opinions but I think on the whole from um certainly from speaking to my participants and also from just being part of communities in general um most neurodivergent people would say that self-diagnosis is valid because you know yourself um better than um well yeah you know your you know yourself and often when it comes to things like autism um and ADHD I know a lot of people will have done a lot of research I certainly did a lot of reading and learning and exploring um so a lot of people would say that self-diagnosis is valid um the difficulties that come up is that what's interesting is that some of my participants did say that self-diagnosis is valid um, but also felt that there needed to be that external uh, medical sort of professional authority to provide almost that kind of um, badge of the diagnosis and it to be official and it to be recognised. There's also issues, obviously, sort of, I suppose, logistical, practical issues of needing the diagnosis officially in order to be able to access support, um, whether that be um, support that doesn't really exist in a lot of places but or whether that be um also to be able to access things like with adhd to be able to access medication if that's the route that people want to go down yeah absolutely um and we recently got a little bit of funding to offer some post-diagnostic support i um, saw that yes well we had funding i can say this now because not everybody's going to see it but um we had funding for 32 places we got 206 applications in yeah. 14 hours. So, um, yeah, <laughs> the, the need is is out there. Yeah, massively. We knew, I mean, not that that was a surprise. Okay, so the next question is, you mentioned it's relatively new to be diagnosed with both autism and ADHD, but is it possible to receive this diagnosis with one assessment? That's a good question. So I don't think it's possible at the moment to have just one assessment that that kind of diagnoses or DHD 
but you can have kind of back-to-back assessments <laughs> that kind of are for autism followed by ADHD so I know for myself um, I kind of had the two in the one sort of it was a very long day um, but I had the two in the one day where you um, are with a professional that can diagnose autism and then they also speak with the other um, team of professionals that are looking at the ADHD and come up with a sort of overall picture of what the diagnosis is together um, but as far as I'm aware there aren't any kind of you can't currently be within the sort of same session same assessment be said to have both because you need I think there's slightly different professionals need to diagnose um, each and there's different tests that are done depending on what criteria is used for the diagnosis. Yeah I mean there's there's certainly private professionals that would be able to diagnose both uh, but you would need to fill in the two separate yeah sections of forms for example yeah so for eight for yeah. ADHD you might you you would need to get a second uh, placement or you know, which is usually if it's a girl if it's a um, young person it would be school usually would fill in that as well as a parent would fill it in um, obviously for an adult that becomes slightly more complicated because you're not at school anymore um, but yeah the same person can do it but you can't you can't just fill in one set of questionnaires mm. Who knows? Again, who knows? In ten yeah, years might time, be so. well, and I might think that's an issue. Yeah, I think that's an issue as well. With it's again, it's very different depending where you live. Um, but I know that's pro that's an issue with a lot of places. The NHS waiting list is that you have to go separately. Um, via you have to go separately to the autism service and then separately to the ADHD. And I know my experience. Um, I had to fight for a bit because the one wouldn't look at you while the you were on the list for the other so it was kind of they were still functioning in a way of well you know go and see if you have autism first because we won't look at that or go, no we think you should look at ADHD first because we won't look at you as autistic until you've done that so it's yeah, yeah luckily that, that is changing there are some local yeah. authorities where they are trying to do both um and if we I mean we advocate for screening for everything <laughs> yeah. you know I, yeah. I believe that you should be screening for for all of the main neurodivergent conditions at the same time and it would save a lot of money and time in the long run but of course yes. once you, when you've got massive waiting lists you can't really do that um, mm. and for ADHD there is the added impetus that um, schools like ADHD to be diagnosed as quickly as possible because then that child might get medication mm -hmm. um, and so that's why sometimes that's why there's separate lists um, and it's always an issue because of because of the ADHD medication. Mm. And of course, there isn't uh, autism medication. Right. Next question. Do you know? Oh, here we go. Do you know if ADHD medication can affect the autism ADHD equilibrium? being more autistic or something like that yeah so there's some some kind of there's anecdotal um responses at the moment so some participants and also others within the community i don't know if there's any studies yet that have shown this um kind of academic research studies that have been completed um but there's sort of anecdotal evidence um that suggests that adhd medication can sometimes um so there's so sometimes ADHD and autism when you have both they can kind of counterbalance each other sometimes and when you have when you treat the ADHD with medication and your ADHD symptoms or characteristics become sort of more in the background or less problematic that can mean that the autism element can come more to the fore and I know some people have experienced um, kind of feeling or finding particularly sensory issues they struggle more with as an autistic person um, when their ADHD is treated with medication um, than not. But it's it's not had enough, as with a lot of things in this area at the moment, there's not been sort of research studies that I'm aware of that properly explore that yet. That's just from what people's been what people have been saying um, with their experiences. And I think there's also there's also more com complicated elements in that autistic people um, can often be more sensitive to medication as well. So not just ADHD medication, but medication in general. Autistic people can be more sensitive to medication um, and our bodies, our bodies do weird things um, and respond weirdly to different things. So 
there's that sort of element as well and it's quite I think yeah it can be quite an individual basis on how someone responds and there's lots of different medications as well so there's different treatments to try and different um, side effects different responses for different people so it's not it's not such an easy answer I think as if you take ADHD medication you'll be more less autistic or yeah. less autistic or more than less. I, I always try and caveat that with ADHD medication because there isn't ADHD medication there's lots and lots of different varieties of ADHD ADHD medication which affect everybody differently so it's kind of you have to try different things um but yeah I also I have personal uh experience of exactly this phenomena um when my daughter tried ADHD medication it was a nightmare um it her quieting quite sorry I just can't speak tonight quieting down her brain um making her brain less busy kind of left space for noise for sensory um sensitivity to noise for misophonia um and what what wasn't very bad before that became very very bad almost unbearable and actually hasn't gone away since although she hasn't taken ADHD Um. meds for at least three years oh wow um, the yeah effects of it hasn't changed so but again that's just her and I don't want yes. that to put people off trying ADHD meds because it might not happen to you or your child so next question how often do you get ADHD women who have on the face of it held it together and are successful but struggling inside um, I think it's probably very common. I think it's a lot more common than we think. Um, certainly just from beginning to do research in this area and from my own experiences, I think we're just kind of at the tip of the iceberg of starting to see a lot of women come forward and and admit and say that actually um, I'm really struggling. And it's usually points around, there's usually some kind of key moments for women to get diagnosed. One of them is if their children get diagnosed um, they start to recognize the same sorts of struggles in themselves um, also having children or um, menopause perimenopause having big sort of life changes life events it's usually things that happen that um, reach a point um, there's like the sort of tipping point of these sorts of accumulative crises or points um, that sort of lead lead women to then seek an explanation and be diagnosed I suspect that there's probably um quite quite a lot of women who are have been diagnosed for a very long time with mental health difficulties that could be explained by um autism and or ADHD um not saying that they don't also have mental health conditions but I think often a lot of that can be a symptom rather than the cause um, so I think it's yeah happening. We don't have we don't have numbers at the moment, um, but there has been an increase in diagnosis and increase in um, women seeking diagnoses, and you can see that from kind of like Facebook support groups and also like someone's mentioned today about wait li- wait lists have become years years and years long in areas for people to get a diagnosis. Yeah, I'd agree with all that. Um, and, you know, and anecdotally from my Facebook group as well, there's more than 22,000 people in there. And yeah, I would say it's relatively common. Um, but I would also add it's an it's about an internal profile. We're not only talking about well, I mean, we are only talking about women and girls in this, um, but it's it's anyone who has an internal profile. Um, my husband, for example, is autistic when um when the psychiatrist diagnosed my daughter as ADHD he was there as well and he and she jokingly said to my daughter oh yeah your dad's got girly autism um she she was only joking she didn't really believe that there's girly autism. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yes yeah. he, he certainly has mm-hmm. not or an, an internal profile of autism and outwardly it would look like he's very successful he went to Oxford he's a chartered accountant he's been married for oh dear (laughs) I'm not sure exactly how many years 27 maybe anyway a long time Um, that's that's not very good that I don't know that is it because obviously he's married to me um but on the surface he looks very successful but yes certainly he would fit that kind of hold it together but but struggling inside 
So next one. As an ODHD woman, I feel different to both autistic lonely or ADHD only women. Is this usual? Are there any specific support, for example, groups for ODHD women? Um, it is usual. I, in my own experience and in participants' experiences and what I've seen people say, um, this is why I like to kind of think of it as being obviously purple because I love purple, but um, the combination of both is something different in itself um, that isn't the same as just autism or just ADHD. Um, and people have explained and said that they don't feel like they fully fit within either of those sorts of communities or groups. Um, I'm not currently aware of any sort of specific ODHD groups. I know that there's um, there's kind of conversations on Twitter or X as it now is. Um, and I know that a lot of Facebook groups that are for one or the other tend to have um, people that are both within it. Um, because I think increasingly the sort of numbers that are um, diagnosed with both autism and ADHD is increasing. But I imagine there will be some groups out there. Um, but there's none that I can think of off the top of my head that I would kind of signpost towards. Yeah, I can't think of any either. Uh, but we'll look for some. Um, question. My experience is that ODHD has created a balance in me, making others think everything is fine. It's not. Could this be part of why it takes so long to realise or to seek a diagnosis? Yeah, I think that's a big thing. I think because the two can sometimes because they can contradict but they can also counterbalance that you um that people and particularly often if you've also got this more kind of internalized presentation and experience um so it's not being seen externally so much um so particularly with like if your hyperactivity is more racing thoughts and it is having to kind of run around um it's a lot harder to recognize that in yourself and also for others to recognize that um there's an added element if you are a girl or a woman that there's a gender element that studies have shown that that girls and boys who kind of um exhibit the same symptoms girls are less likely to be referred um for assessment by teachers and parents than boys are um so i think there's lots of different layers but i definitely think i do think the two can um appear to balance each other out potentially um but i also think there's a big element here about it being potentially more internalized um, so I know a lot of my a lot of my struggles um, I've struggled had mental health difficulties for my whole life um, and a lot of the struggles that I've had were very much more internalized than perhaps necessarily external um, and those that were external get labeled or they get um, interpreted as being um, you know signs of being that you're just difficult or you're um dramatic or emotional or all these different things um and that's really difficult when you don't know about that yourself either so you don't almost it's hard to know I think as well it's hard to know what the sort of neurotypical standard is because you just assumed or I certainly assumed um and a lot of um people I've spoken to said that they assumed all their lives that everybody was experiencing the world in the same way but other people were just easier like coping better like people particularly with sensory things that everybody finds a lot of clothes like makes you want to tear your skin off and you can't and you can hear everything and you can hear the electricity and all of it everybody's got all this going on but they just tune it out and they can deal with it um but then when you actually learn oh actually not everybody does have this it's a bit of a like oh moment yeah absolutely um, so next question, do you think the assessment criteria will be revised anytime soon to take account of the female presentation, in particular for ADHD, where there is a focus on demonstrating evidence from early childhood, which is hard when you were a high achieving, high masking ODHD girl who was keen to please and not get into trouble. Psychiatry UK refused to diagnose me because of this and the guy had a stereotyped view of how ADHD presents. Yeah, that's really disappointing. Um, I think definitely I know that work is being done with professionals to try and change um, these views. I also think that there will be changes. Um, and I know that there is research being done around diagnostic criteria and developing diagnostic criteria. But there's a lot of layers and politics involved that make it very difficult. Um, so 
the the last kind of um diagnostic manual um that uh, enabled both to be diagnosed together there was um autistic working groups that went into trying to kind of um help define and develop the autism diagnosis category and they worked very hard to to kind of have that have an impact but didn't fully manage to um feed everything into that because there are a lot of layers of politics in terms of who who writes the manuals who benefits from them how they get just decided how then it changes then the kind of filter down to the change in practice um so I think I do think definitely over I'd say like you know the next I hope to see over the next decade or so change um but it's disappointing that there are professionals that don't know enough um and particularly when if you don't have a choice of where to go to because I know there are I know there are some really good um professionals and services that are specialized in these areas and are more aware but you don't necessarily have that choice if you're going by the NHS or if it's location dependent yeah um next question is there anyone doing research who is interested in family stroke genes my son has ADHD diagnosed at 33 currently awaiting uh, autism assessment my niece is 12 she had a diagnosis of ADHD and currently awaiting assessment for autism I have reason to believe my mum had what was then Asperger's and there's me 66 years old def definitely ADHD all the years of fears and tears will be the name of my book I think I'm autistic too so there's recognition that there's definitely a genetic component um, with neurodiversity. The kind of um, degree to which genes play a role isn't fully known, um, but it, there is recognition that genes definitely play a role because you do tend to see families that have neurodiversity um, throughout, um, throughout them and different generations. I think in terms of research, of it's sort of, I suppose, that can be quite a thorny area in terms of research agendas because most of the money, most of the research funding and money and attention historically for, say, autism has gone on trying to figure out where it comes from. So is it genetic? Where does it come from? And there's sometimes that can be tied into an agenda of finding out where it comes from so that we can get rid of it, um, which is a bit of a political issue um, that a lot of autistic people wouldn't be aren't happy about. Um, and I think where I stand I certainly want more research and more funding to look into the actual experiences of people with autism and ADHD and other neurodivergence to in order to better understand that and rather than I suppose trying to kind of figure out where it comes from as much yeah um do you think ADHD coaching can be helpful for all the HDers I think um, I think neurodivergent coaching definitely. So I think if you work with a coach, um, so I've been quite um, lucky to have worked with a really fantastic coach who is ADHD. Um, so there are neurodivergent coaches out there who who are themselves autistic and ADHD and can relate to that. Um, but I do think ADHD coaching, um, if you work with a good coach, that can definitely be a really helpful um, thing to do to help manage well to, to help work on lots of different things but managing so, to build strategies and building self-esteem building confidence but so I definitely recommend coaching with with a good coach that you get on with there seem to be loads of them on LinkedIn at the moment <sighs> um can you tell us a bit more about the process of reauthoring or any resource around this um so when you say resource around it do you mean in terms of how to do it or resource around like the academic research about it so there's kind of in terms of how to do it it's something that we kind of naturally start doing when we start thinking about how we look back on our lives and and sort of understand things through a different lens so it's like when you get a diagnosis and you put those glasses on and you kind of see oh I I wasn't a really I wasn't a, a a kid that had outrageous tantrums they were actually autistic meltdowns um and starting to understand and revisit your life experiences and yourself through that sort of lens of neurodiversity um things that can help to do that there are resources and books so for adhd there's a book called um so I think something like the radical guide for adhd in women something like that i can i can provide um references 
taffy afterwards if i remember all of them um i can see the cover of the book but i can't remember the full title um but there are some sort of there are some um self-help books that can be really helpful for working through that process of starting to think about your life and yourself through a kind of different lens because you might you we often have had really negative messages and negative way of thinking about ourselves um but then in terms of the academic side um, there are some studies that explore particularly autistic adults um, process of starting to of doing that essentially of how um, and particularly through how in research when someone participates and talks about their life and their experiences so my participants the way that they talk it is about reframing and thinking about their lives in in a different way that now makes more sense through these lenses of autism and ADHD yeah and when you think it's never too late so we had a 83 year old woman wow. join our Facebook group who had just got diagnosed after her daughter and granddaughter were diagnosed so yeah if she, if she can reauthor her life we all yeah. can I guess um so the next question I'll try we haven't got that many so I will try and get through them I'll try and like prop my eyes open with match I was gonna say I know you need to go to bed <laughs> <laughs> Is it common for one or the other conditions to be more prominent at different times of life? For example, it seems my autistic traits were more pro prominent as a kid, but maybe ADHD. Sorry, I really can't speak tonight. Maybe ADHD is more prominent for me now. I have to be an adult and organise myself. Cool, that's what I feel like most days. Do I really have to be an adult and organise <laughs> <I know>. myself? <laughs> Adulting is the word. Um, yeah, I think definitely. And this is something that participants talked about. Um, and it's something that's interesting because people, I suppose people might think about the two as being these sort of constants um, and that if you're autistic and ADHD, then you're 50% of one, 50% of the other. And that just stays that way throughout the whole of your life. But at different moments, different periods, different, I think, different presentations can come to the fore um, and different experiences. Definitely, I relate to that. I definitely also feel that um, as a child, my autism really was quite surprisingly prominent looking back as but then I, I grew up in the early 90s so that's why it wasn't recognized but um whereas ADHD I think potentially does perhaps become more prominent or more noticeable to us maybe as adults because we have so many demands in terms of everything that you have to juggle and do and employment and organizing and whereas that might have been things like um doing homework on time and not losing your PE kit and all of these elements when you're a kid that sometimes uh, hopefully often someone else will kind of take care of for you when it becomes the point where you have to do all that by yourself it's like ah I'm, I can't do that so that might seem potentially how that might might become more prominent um but that's definitely a theme that participants talk about was this sort of at one sometimes in life feeling more adhd or or the adhd brain coming out whereas the autism brain coming out at other times i think that's also one area where where they really overlap though the area of kind of executive yes. dysfunction um I'm, I'm just thinking at the moment just of my my son who was refused an ADHD diagnosis, although I'm still not convinced that that was right. Um, but as he has got older, his, he, you know, it's become really obvious that that's one of his main difficulties, the area of mm -hmm. executive function. Um, and as, as I say, he isn't actually classified as ADHD, um, although we did we paid for a private assessment, but he didn't get a diagnosis. To all those people who say, "Yeah, you just pay for assessment." And yeah. You get one. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but some people, you know, would would think that that executive dysfunction was ADHD, and maybe it is because maybe he yeah. should have an ADHD diagnosis. I'm not sure, um, but I think that's one of those areas where the two might merge a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um. Any recommendations of self-funded private assessments, considering they are so expensive, it would be good to go with one well, well respected if paying out personally. And that very much depends on where you are, unless you're willing to travel the length of the country. Yeah, it just depends where you are, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. um, help for psychology are pretty good. Um, and yeah, adult autism practice uh, are pretty good. Um, Axia Cheshire usually have good recommendations in our Facebook group 
Um, but otherwise, yeah, really pretty much depends where you are. Okay, that might be uh, that might be the last one. I think these the rest are answers, I think. Yeah. So I think we're finished now. Oh, I'm dreading menopause. This <laughs> this overlaps so with the discussion. So am I. So am yes. I. <laughs> well, I I I I mean I'm I don't know whether I'm in menopause or past menopause I don't know but yeah little it's like little bits of my brain fall out every day like Swiss cheese um and I, ha I have meant to be arranging one of these webinars around menopause for I think the last nine months and I haven't got around to it yet so that's real ADHD procrastination for you yes. there <laughs> <laughs> okay so thank you ever so much Emma for coming along and talking to us tonight and yeah if you send me those links then I will put yep. them in the I'll put them in the um, email with the recording um, and thank you do. everybody that's joined us tonight thank you for coming and giving up your evening um, I hope that I mostly made sense <laughs> I, feel, I feel like my brain is not working at 100% tonight but hopefully you could understand what I was saying at least which is all that we can ask for really isn't it yeah. So thanks, everybody, um, and I hope we see you again at the next one. Night. Yeah, thanks very much, Kathy. Night. Okay, bye.